we have uh, completed the old uh, the three series on uh, basics of prayer or basic prayer or prayer basics and uh, tonight we want to go into a different series uh, all together and this time we're going to talk uh, we're going to talk about the holy spirit so we're going to do a short little holy spirit series in uh, uh, this all night prayer because um, we should be more dependent on the spirit than than we have been as christians and so usually our teaching is in an area where we emphasize an area of lack, need, or areas where we need to pay more attention to. And especially all night prayer is good and the teaching is uh, slightly different from Saturday or Thursday. Thursday we try to cover more biblical studies and we go through uh, the Bible systematically. And, uh, and then Sunday we do the normal Sunday teachings. But... Um, uh, all night we won a series that helps us to press further into God. Uh, something that inspires us to draw nearer to God, to draw closer to God, because we do have the time to seek God with, with all our heart. And so we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and uh, how we relate to the Holy Spirit and in this manner. And uh, as Christians, I think we are not as reliant on the Holy Spirit as we should have been. Uh, although Jesus put special emphasis that when he has gone uh, from his earthly ministry, he told his disciples that the Holy Spirit will come. And he expects that we will be more dependent on the Spirit than we, we have been. Partly, I believe, is because we don't know the Holy Spirit as a person very well. We don't know his voice, we don't know his impressions, we don't know how he works, we don't know how he moves, and uh, he's invisible of all things, and uh, he's not necessarily touchable, feelable, or tangible in our normal sense, so how do we relate to such a person of the Holy Spirit? And because of that, we tend to neglect him, ignore him, and did not give him the place in our life that we should. The Holy Spirit has actually been given unto us as a replacement of the physical presence of Jesus. In the Gospel of John, you know how deep in each on our heart, sometimes we thought that Christian life, it would be good if it's easy, if Jesus was just right beside us, just right with us, as Jesus was with his disciples. Well, Jesus gave the Holy Spirit for that purpose. And uh, when in the Gospel of John chapter 14, as he speaks about uh, him going and the Holy Spirit coming, he tells us here in uh, John chapter 14, he says in verse 17, uh, verse six, John 14, verse 16, 17, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, uh, another parakletos, one call alongside to help. In some versions, another comforter. Another advocate in some versions. And here the New King James put as helper. Basically they are trying to translate the Greek word parakletos. And uh, kletos is one called alongside. And uh, uh, para is alongside. And um, from the word kleo, which is to call. So he's one called to be with us. He says in verse 16, That he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you i will not leave you orphans i will come to you so he's not going to leave us as orphans but he's going to uh, come to us through his holy spirit in a different manner in a different form and um, then he t tells us what the Holy Spirit will do in verse 26. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. So when we don't know anything, we can ask Holy Spirit to teach us. But if we can't hear him, how can he teach us? If we don't know him, how can we talk to him? He will teach us all things. The word all covers not just spiritual things, but natural things. Uh, anything in this life. And of course, the Holy Spirit works with the angels who are with us. We have done a series on angels. And the Holy Spirit is here to teach us all things and bring 
to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So Jesus is there. And since uh, we are unlike the disciples, where we haven't been with Jesus for three years physically, but we all have the Bible. So having read the Bible, the Holy Spirit will bring the Bible or verses of the Bible to your remembrance. In the Gospel of John chapter 15, John 15 continues on and uh, <coughs> says of uh, the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and we read John 15 uh, was... Uh, we look at verse uh, 7 and 8. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. But this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. And chapter, 16, uh, chapter 15 verse 26. When the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of me. The word testify is uh, to bear witness. He will bear witness of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So the Holy Spirit is going to testify uh, of Jesus Christ. He's going to bear witness inside us of Jesus in chapter 16. Again, the work of the Holy Spirit. And it says, uh, and this is a slightly longer section from verse 7 onwards. Nevertheless, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. The Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, Jesus says, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you. So Jesus got lots and lots of things to tell his disciples, but he says you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I say that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So obviously we are supposed to have a very close, close and knitted relationship with the Holy Spirit. We are supposed to know the Holy Spirit uh, intimately, even though He's invisible. But to many Christians, they ask, what is the Holy Spirit like? Since He's invisible, we can't teach, touch Him with our natural body. But surely, there are some ways in which we can learn of the Spirit and, uh, and, and learn of the ways of the Spirit and what He's doing within us. And so, number one, the Holy Spirit, when whatever He does, there is always a fruit of His presence. When the Holy Spirit flows, He leaves behind certain sensations within us. And that sensation, I want to list it as uh, in line with the fruit of the Holy of the Spirit. Even though Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, 23, uh, did not mention Holy Spirit and you can look at the fruit of the Spirit as either fruit of the Holy Spirit or fruit of the human spirit. My answer to you is both. Because the sp human spirit got it from the Holy Spirit. And so in point number one, whatever the Spirit does, whatever He flows, the fruit will be there. It is just like, um, if you have a demon of fear, there will be fear. If you have, uh, remember Jesus uh, freed uh, uh, a woman who was uh, having some sort of ailment on her, uh, on her back and she was bent, back, bent downwards and uh, Jesus, she was oppressed and Jesus set her free uh, because she's a daughter of Abraham, Jesus, Jesus declared. And there was an oppression of the demonic power. And so demons will produce after their kind. 
So uh, a demon of sickness will produce uh, a sickness, a deaf and dumb spirit. Of course, uh, it's not that spirit is deaf and dumb, but they attack the areas of speech and of hearing. So it causes a person to be deaf and dumb. Then uh, that is the sign that the evil spirit is working. Uh, and of course, uh, whatever demonic area that operate always produce after their kind. Now the Holy Spirit, when He moves and He works within us, he will always produce love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. All the fruit of the Spirit. So let's have a look at that in the book of Galatians. Book, book of Galatians. These are ways in which you recognize the Holy Spirit working within us. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, 23. Now, because uh, verse 16 is talking about walking in the Spirit, and it's talking about capital S. I don't know, in your Bible, in the New Kingdom, it capitalizes S, uh, which implies the Holy Spirit. So it says, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the last of the flesh. So obviously, when you walk in the Spirit, you immediately have victory over the other side. And... Uh, and he says, for the flesh lasts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so you do not have the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, now verse 16 is talking about the Holy Spirit. You are not under the law. And then he goes to verse 22. So if verse 16 is the Holy Spirit, uh, and verse uh, 18 is the Holy Spirit, then verse 22 can be implied to be the Holy Spirit also. But uh, given the uh, line upon line precept upon precept teaching, you can interpret verse 22, 23 as a human spirit. But uh, you can also interpret as a Holy Spirit. In fact, you can interpret as both because the human spirit has it from the Holy Spirit. So for time being tonight, let's look at it as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kind, gentleness, goodness, kindness, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are all, uh, my memory is from the Old King James, the Old New King James way. And it says uh, in verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So whenever the Holy Spirit moves or works within us, you will always sense uh, one of these nine fruit of the Spirit. Primarily, it is love. Now, all these fruit of the Spirit uh, are not as nine different things. They are one thing in nine different shapes. And what is the one thing? They are love. All the fruit of the Spirit are different applications of the love of God. Uh, when you compare Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 23, with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you find that love is gentle, so there's gentleness. And uh, then you talk about uh, love uh, uh, being peaceful, and love does not strive, love thinks no evil. So you find that all the listing in 1 Corinthians 13 cover the ninth fruit of the Spirit, and they're all produced by love. So although they're all different fruit, that is, uh, seem to be produced, uh, behind it, the source of all the fruit, and when they name it as, as love as a primary thing, uh, love produces all the others, love, joy, peace, and all those things. But those are how we taste them. Uh, it, it's how, how it expresses in our life. Uh, for example, uh, when you talk about peace, it talks about in a time of strife. You ex the love in your heart experiences peace. When you talk about you're on a mountaintop experience, that love in you bubbles up and it produces joy. So it's all related to love. Whenever the Holy Spirit flows and moves, there is always the love of God. And it's the love of God with the peace inside. And we are inner joy. Then you know there is a Holy Spirit. Because you can't see the Spirit. You can't touch the Spirit. And sometimes when the Spirit talks to you, speaks to you, it's not in a voice. It is an impression of love. John Osteen, has, uh, who was uh, uh, Joel Osteen's father, John Osteen who has gone to be with the Lord, he has one tiny little booklet called, um, I think he called it Divine Flow of Love. 
when he talks about being led by the Spirit, and he calls it being led by love. Uh, that is his way of understanding from his experience how he flows with the Spirit of God. Uh, and when you think about people in the Bible, how are they led by the Spirit? Uh, how do they flow? Uh, did the Holy Spirit come personally and talk to them side by side? It's not that way. They learn to be sensitive to how the Spirit flows into them. Because when the Spirit came, He poured out the love of God upon us. Look at the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, it says here in verse 5, Now hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. By who? By the Holy Spirit. Who was given to us. So the pouring of love into our hearts is one of the primary ways in which the Holy Spirit leads you. So some people say, how, how do, when people say they are led by the Spirit, how are they led by the Spirit? What, what, what indication did they have? Did they see a vision, a television screen, or a dream, or whatever? It can come in all those manner. But primarily, they sought to be led by love. The love of God, that is. Agape love of God. And that is, that is a primary way in which God leads us. Let's look at some examples in the Bible of the people being led by the Holy Spirit, but this time, uh, through love. Let's look first of all in the book of Second Corinthians. Now, 2 Corinthians, Paul was talking about how he uh, ministered to uh, the Corinthians. And he says here in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and he was talking about how much uh, uh, he, what he wrote in 1 Corinthians. And although there is 1 Corinthians in our Bible, 2 Corinthians, because 1 Corinthians refer to another letter he wrote before that, some people call 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and our 2 Corinthians, 3 Corinthians. But since we lost the 1 Corinthians, we only got 1 and 2 Corinthians. But 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul tells us about his 1 Corinthians letter and says in verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3, he says, And I wrote this very thing to you, Lest when I come, I should have sorrow over those from whom I, I ought to have joy, having confidence in, in all that my joy is the joy of you all. See, Paul was flowing with joy when he was writing things led by the Spirit. And his writings, as you know, have become part of the Bible. And in verse 4, it says here, in verse 4, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Now, we are not talking about ordinary human love here. We are talking about Him being led by the Spirit. Remember Romans chapter 5, verse 5. The love of God is shared abroad. Of course, our English word shed abroad doesn't convey the Greek word. The word shed abroad is actually literally to pour into your heart the love of God. It's pour, not just you know, shed. It's just like you shed a tear, a tiny little bit flowing. Uh, but in the Greek word shed abroad, is, uh, that's why I say abroad. Uh, I don't know why they translate it that way, but it's an English expression. But the Greek is it pour his love into you. And so there's a supernatural love that you feel flowing into you then you know it's the Holy Spirit. So you don't, need a, you don't need necessarily to have a vision, to have a dream, see an angel, but the love of God pour mightily into your heart and you feel it beating within you. That's the Holy Spirit trying to tell you something. Because you always live behind the presence of His love. So Paul says that when he wrote his epistle, he wrote it because of the great love he was feeling. And it was pouring out through him. Now you know why 1 Corinthians ends up in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The most beautiful chapters on love that you ever have in the whole Bible. Because he was writing it out of love flowing. Then he talked about love is this and love is that. 
he was being led and anointed by love. That is how the Holy Spirit flows. And sometimes in the church, they make decisions, not necessarily because they saw a vision. They may have a vision once in a while, or a dream once in a while, but all the time, they always flow, and they are led by the Spirit to motivate them, you can call it, or flow through their life, and they know what to do by flowing with the love of God that God placed in their life. In that manner, all of us can be led by the Spirit. So like uh, in the book of Acts, when you look at the various missionary journeys that uh, they have gone through, the beginning of the missionary journey, of course, is very dramatic in chapter 13 of Acts, uh, verse uh, 1 and 2, where the Holy Spirit supernaturally spoke to the apostles and prophets to separate Barnabas and Paul for the work which he, they, ha they have. And then they fasted and they prayed and they laid hands and they sent them away. That is Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 2. Two, 1 to 2 and verse 3 they sent them away and it says in verse 4 they were sent out by the Holy Spirit but then when they came back after the first missionary uh, journey that is uh, chapter 14 they came to Antioch and they talked about how God has done great things and they find that uh, they had the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 and then after the Jerusalem Council how they started a second missionary journey, there was no more, they didn't actually have, um, have a, a vision or voice of the Holy Spirit like the first time. It says in uh, Acts 15, after the conference in, in Jerusalem, it says in verse 35, Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others. So they, they were there in Antioch preaching and teaching. But it says in verse 30, see, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now, that was just the leading of the Spirit. It was just a prompting in the heart, probably a desire, a, a, the love of God was flowing. He wants to see how they are doing. God's love was stirring them to go and visit the brethren there. And uh, they end up in Paul's second missionary journey. And uh, as you read on, they became two teams. And then he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening all the churches. And in chapter 16, they just keep on going and keep on going and keep on going. And along the way, they did get a Macedonian call. Uh, because they were visiting all the various brethren, flowing with the Holy Spirit. Were they led by the Spirit? Yes. But the leading of the Spirit was through love their love for the brethren. And they went around and, and along the way, as they tried to go to new places, the Holy Spirit stopped them until they have the Macedonian call. Then they went to a brand new area in, uh, in Philippi uh, because they knew that that was the direction God wanted them to go. So it was love that brought them to the place first before they have the vision. The vision came after. And uh, third missionary journey started more as an impression that Paul had as he passed by. Uh, certain place in uh, book of Acts chapter 18 Acts chapter 18 says there in verse 19 he came to Ephesus and left them there uh, there is a companion Priscilla and Aquila but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews when they asked him to stay a longer time with them he did not consent but he took leave of them saying I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem but I will return to you again to you God willing so then he went off to Jerusalem and in verse 22 of the Jerusalem he landed in Caesarea and he went up then greeted the church he went down to Antioch which was his base and that ended his second missionary journey when he went back to Antioch. And he spent some time there. He strengthened the disciples there in verse 23. And as he traveled uh, along the route, finally in chapter 19, verse 1, he came back to Ephesus, where he's, he originally was, was uh, supposed to go. And that was his third missionary journey. He ended up in one of the biggest revival there. But that revival in Ephesus... He didn't have a big vision like uh, he had in Troas. But he was just led by the love to visit the brethren. A desire to go along and flow along. And that was a very big revival in Ephesus. 
So we don't always have to, when we say the Holy Spirit, many people refer to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's a one section. But we are actually led by the Spirit and we must sense His love flowing. And tonight, as we pray all night, and as you flow in different things, uh, you can only be led by the Spirit to pray and flow in the area where your passion and the love of God captures you. It is almost uh, impossible to pray successfully for an area where the love of God is not operating in your life. In order to flow with the Spirit, we must flow in the areas where the love of God is flowing within us. And as you, are, you pray in, your, in the spirit of your understanding, try to sense the love of God in you. And as you are able to sense the love of God in you, that it is shed abroad in your heart, then that, that love of God in you is like a... Um, just forgot the words uh, for that, that scientific instrument where it can measure uh, up, down, left, right. And uh, so it's like an internal thing that they have on a plane. And that helps them tell them whether the plane is up or down, left or right. And, uh, and so that the love of God that is placed in our heart is like that substance or like a guidance system and as you pray you need to be led by that love of God that flows within you in which direction is leading you now you you're talking about your heart not your mind and so that love of God will sometimes want to flow in a certain direction and you need to flow with the love of God don't resist the Holy Spirit the Old Testament people were always accused of being stiff necked and they always resist the Holy Spirit. We must not resist the Spirit. We must be led by the Spirit. After all, we have been born again not for ourselves. We're talking about being led by the Spirit, letting the Spirit rule in our heart, letting the Spirit guide us. And uh, we are, our position actually to the Holy Spirit, we are slaves. Slaves of righteousness. Romans tells us, we have been freed from a slave to sin to slave of righteousness. So the Holy Spirit is now a master in our life and we must learn to let Him be the King. Because it's Jesus through the Holy Spirit ruling in our life, leading us. So that a slave doesn't even decide what to do. Every day when a slave gets up, you think the slave can decide, okay, what, what shall I do today? No, we cannot. Every day when a slave gets up, the slave had to check with his master what he must do. It's the master that tells him what to do. And to the Holy Spirit, he, the Holy Spirit fills us, we become slaves of righteousness, to be led by the Spirit. And you can, you can a lot of times Christians just ignore the Holy Spirit and do what they want. But you don't want that kind of life anymore. Then each time you want to flow with the Spirit, and each day you get up, and each time you, you seek to be closer with God, say, Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me. And then many people, when they pray that straight away, they start looking for visions or something. The moment you pray, lead me and guide me, the love of God that is already in your heart will be strengthened. And if, if you cannot sense the love of God in your heart, then that's where you need to begin. To sense the love of God. In Romans 5 verse 5, the love of God is flowing. Sense the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And the Bible calls it a fruit. A fruit takes time to develop. It grow, fruit grows on trees, on plants. And we are the trees of God that He plants. And we need to grow in God under the fruit of grows within us and once it grows you can feel the fruit of love in your heart and you can feel love joy peace those are the beginnings of it and as you feel love joy peace that's where you begin to be led by that love in whatever direction he wants you including sometimes in online prayer what to pray for which direction to pray for 
and, uh, and he will put the love of God flowing in your life the passion to pray for people to pray for things to pray for a different areas and it will flow through your life and as you pray you're led by him sometimes outside the meeting and throughout the day he can impress you with a with a remembrance of a person and you feel a compassion towards people who sometimes you never thought of they just like float to your mind and float to your understanding it's because possibly the Holy Spirit wants you to pray for them or minister to them and you could minister to them by letter by email or by phone or just you know an intercession for them you need to flow with the Spirit as every day we flow with the Spirit of God then the Spirit of God will guide us more and more and some of you have been through that like um, uh, sometimes uh, like even sometimes you could walk on the street uh, or, or a stranger and sometimes you see a poor person there and uh, you might pass by but then something stirs you like a compassion guess who was doing that Holy Spirit and then you might ignore it and just go on because the promptings of the Holy Spirit are so gentle they are easily ignored Holy Spirit has been symbolized as a fire and as a dove in Jesus life and a dove can only rest gently on a branch that is not uh, uh, shaking too much a, love, a dove needs gentleness and so when, when we are not uh, too busy doing uh, different things, then the Holy Spirit can work in our life. But when we have our own intention, all our ideas and all those things, then the Holy Spirit cannot flow within us. We must bring ourselves to the quiet solitude, things of the Spirit, and hear the Spirit and be led by the Spirit where to go and what to do. So led by the Spirit, is to be led by the love of God within us and then as we look in the book of uh, um, Acts we look first in the book of Acts here that as Paul traveled through all his uh, the places where uh, the spirit led him we are told here in the book of uh, Acts chapter 16 in the second missionary journey verse 6 to 8 says when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia so apparently the Holy Spirit forbade them it didn't say how that was done but it did say the Holy Spirit forbade them and after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. Question is, how did the Holy Spirit forbade them? I mean, talking and preaching by Paul, he could have gone on to do it. After all, he has a, his own, he has control of his own voice. He has control of his own physical body. He could have gone in. So what actually was stopping Paul externally? Nothing. It's not like there was actual, you know, Holy Spirit appears a person and says stop or something. No. It was more an internal sensation they must be sensing as they go into the place. That something was stopping. Something just cannot flow. They are very sensitive to what was happening inside them when they cannot flow they just came out what would be their sensation what, what was it like that they felt I believe that they might sense like some sort of discomfort and I can only say the opposite of the love like, like no more peace uh, uh, no more joy they lost the joy lost the peace now, if any time you lost your joy and your peace, you have just stepped outside the boundary of the kingdom of God. Look at the book of Romans chapter 14. 
Romans. In the book of Romans, <coughs> Verse uh, 17. Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So you talk about the kingdom of God. Of course, you can have your fellowship, your feast, and all those things. But what Paul was emphasizing, because in Romans 14, they were arguing about uh, whether to eat vegetables, to eat meat, uh, or, or what not to eat, what to eat, all those things. Paul said, hey, forget about not eating this and, and eating that and, and all these things. He said, the kingdom of God is not those things, not the natural thing. The kingdom of God is where you can feel righteousness, you can feel love, you can feel joy, you can feel peace. And so he's talking about the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy. So the moment you step outside an atmosphere where righteousness, peace, and joy are not there, you are no more in the kingdom. He said, is it possible that we sometimes step out of, outside of the kingdom of God? I thought we carry the kingdom of God everywhere we are. Yes, but we have free will. If you go to a place where the Holy Spirit don't want you to go, you just step outside, you lose your peace, lose your joy. It is possible. And suddenly your joy disappears, suddenly your peace disappears. Some Christians have lost their peace and joy for many years and still didn't know it. Which explains sometimes why they need to hear the messages, how to be a happy Christian. <laughs> anyway, so they lost their righteousness, peace and joy and still don't, didn't know it. Because they are not taught to be sensitive to that. Remember, wherever there is no righteousness, no peace and joy, you are no more in the kingdom. You just step outside into the kingdom of the devil. And you are either in the kingdom of light or in the kingdom of darkness. Remember that in this world, there is no gray area. Now, I, I realize that in many decisions of life, you know, uh, they are in a situation where, where, where black and white exist simultaneously in the same place, so it looks grayish. But yet the lines of division, where the presence of God is and the presence of God is not, the Bible tells us very clearly in the book of uh, Colossians, in the book of Colossians, it makes that division clearly, but as we teach, then you begin to see how important these areas are. Uh, areas that are so, and I, if I keep using this phrase, easily ignored. Colossians chapter 1, he tells them in verse 13, He has delivered us from the power of darkness, and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Again, you see that love there. So you're either in darkness or you're in light. There is no halfway. Now, the question you ask is, can a Christian walk in darkness? Let the Bible answer for you. And I'll read the Bible for you. First John chapter 1. I have known Christians who walk in darkness and sometimes during one, a day, one day they walk in and in and out of darkness about 100 times and didn't know it. They've been, they, they're getting their passport stamps to and fro out of darkness, in and out, without even knowing. They exit the kingdom of God without a visa. In the book of uh, 1 John, 1 John, it says here, in verse uh, 5, we declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. And then he continues in chapter 2. He says, he, in verse 4, he says, He who says, I know him, does not keep his commandments, is a liar, 
and the truth is not in him. And uh, <clears throat> then it says in verse 9, uh, verse 8 and 9, Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light, and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, he is talking about Christians who don't walk in love. I know Christians who don't walk in love. So, how do you divide in your mind the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness? In your mind, you divide it by religiosity. You thought that everyone who is born again, and because they call themselves Christian, and they go around saying hallelujah, and sometimes even talking in tongues, plus carrying the Bible, that they will automatically be part of the kingdom of light. No, sir. Not from the spiritual point of view. A Christian who does not walk in God's love because God is love, is not actually part of the kingdom of God. He belongs in, to the kingdom of God, but is walking in the kingdom of the devil. We slip in and out of the kingdom of darkness without knowing it. Sometimes when you lose your righteousness, peace and joy and love. Say, wow. Yes. And whenever you come across, whether it be a believer or unbeliever who walks in darkness, what would you normally do if you knew, if your spiritual eyes were open and you see the darkness? Remember, in darkness means they are cohorts with the devil even though their nature might not be of the devil. You walk away because light has nothing to do with darkness. It has nothing to do with darkness. And so those who walk in God's love, then you have fellowship. So, which comes first? Light or darkness comes first or fellowship? You look very carefully that we, they have no fellowship with darkness. You walk in the light, then there is fellowship. Because how can uh, you sit down for a meal with the devil? How can you light sit down for a meal with darkness? You can't do that. So it's important, it's more important to flow in the love of God then we realize. And as we say in, in the first point, uh, we talk about uh, walking in the love of God as being yielding to the Spirit, understanding how the Holy Spirit works. And in second point, we were trying to see how the Holy Spirit stopped them. And uh, it's, like, it's like the opposite of love. If ever, if ever you enter into a place where suddenly you lose your peace, suddenly you lose joy, you have to immediately examine why you lost it. Is it because you have, you have walked outside of something God does not want you to go into? And if we will pay attention more to the internal sensing of love, joy and peace, we would never walk into darkness and always you will have all the blessings of Abraham and all the good things of God that he talked about in his kingdom, his righteousness, love, peace and joy and all his goodness, you'll always be enjoying it. Because you walk in the love of God. So, we ask ourselves the question while seeking to bring the second point. How did Paul knew and Silas, and at that time they took Timothy with him, as they tried to go into Bithynia and Mysia, the spirits forbade them, forbade, stopped them. Because something in their hearts lost the peace, lost the love lost the sense of it. And they immediately pulled back. They immediately pulled back. Whereas 
our modern Christians, they lose their peace, lose their joy, still go, still, you know, as you say in your Hokkien, kaka, still go. And then after they go for one, two years, they look back, the Holy Spirit is still waiting down, didn't go along with them. Then you get yourself into trouble and say, help! And God says, alright, I'll help you now send an angel, pull us back right to the shores where we're supposed to be. We need to flow. And, and it's not like a physical, geographical line we draw. You know how in our mind we all draw physical line. We thought, okay, if the if a church is here, you draw the line where the church is, and that church is there, and you draw a line. Oh no, because people can be called themselves by by Christianity, called themselves by Christianity, called themselves as a Christian, but if they don't walk in the Holy Spirit, they are not led by the Spirit. They're in darkness. Then they are. It's a different kingdom. That. It's a kingdom of light in kingdom of darkness that is no halfway in the spiritual dimension. You're either in or you're out. Say, can the person walk out? Yes. First John. The moment you 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 allow hate to come into your life, the moment you are you are allowing all the works of the enemy to come into your life, and uh, there's no more love in your life, no more peace in your life, no more joy in your life. You're no more in light. You're in darkness need to pull back. We need to be sensitive to the love of God. We need, number two, to be sensitive where there is no love, no joy, no peace. Now, we can bring that love, joy and peace to any place He sends us to where it's His will for us to be there. We recognize up to the gates of hell and even conquer hell. But, you cannot let it inside of you. Inside of us and surrounding us is righteousness, peace and joy. So how did Paul and Silas and Timothy know that the Spirit forbid them? Because they sense, it says in Romans 14 verse 17, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy. And you step outside the kingdom, suddenly righteousness, peace and joy disappear. They step back. They quickly step back. Into a place where they once again can sense righteousness, peace and joy. So that is an important control factor that Paul has uh, in his life. And what happens if you step in the right area in the book of Acts? In the book of Acts. We see here in Acts chapter 18, in verse 5, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. The word compel, or some translations say stir by the Spirit, is from the Greek word suneko. Suneko. Suneko is a combination of two Greek words. One is the Greek word sun. Uh, suneko Romanized is S-U-N-E-C-H-O. And uh, the word sun, uh, spelled S-U-N, we, uh, sun, but it's pronounced sun. Soon is where you get the word uh, synagogue. Soon. Synagogue. Uh, and uh, it means a gathering together. Gathering together. Uh, to gather together. To soon. Uh, like a symbiosis together. And the second word is the word uh, echo. Uh, echo in a Greek. Uh, means I have. So it's a gathering together and a having. And so I could imagine from the Greek word what Paul was experiencing. He was experiencing as if something was holding on to him. He could literally feel the Spirit compelling him. Now I don't know any one of you have felt that before. But the Spirit can 
compel you. Something stir up. And in some translations say he was pressed in the spirit. The Greek word is two combinations. It's a combination of gather together and uh, having. Echo means, you know, to have, to hold. And uh, so something was holding Paul together. It was like he felt the Holy Spirit put his arms around him. He felt something pressing him to share, to talk about the Lord. Something was pushing forward out of him. That is a compelling that he experienced. And that would be another sensation of the Spirit. We say we have to sense love and then we have to sense the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace and joy. And where it is not. That's point two. Point three is here is uh, where the spirit actually join with your human spirit and you're pressed and you're stirred and you're pushed forward uh, into something and you know it's the Holy Spirit initiating it in your life and it's not just you anymore. It's the spirit coming forth out of you. And uh, did Paul still have a free will and free choice? Yes. But it was easier to yield. It was a, uh, and the third stage is different from the second one. Second one is you, you, if you're outside the kingdom, you lose your righteousness, peace, and joy. And you've got to keep retaining and only, only do the thing, be in a place where righteousness, peace, and joy is there. You could sense it. If you ever lose it, examine why you lose it and when you lost it. I mean, if on your way here and uh, one of you drop your wallet, uh, you'll be looking for your wallet. Or, or your purse, if you're a lady, wallet or purse, uh, and, and you lost your purse, you lost your wallet, you'll be looking for it. Because why all your important things are kept in your wallet or purse, so you're looking for it. Uh, and and if, you, if you go any place, anywhere, and you lose your righteousness, peace and joy, you've got to get it back. Get to the place or position where, when, when do you lose it? And in the third area, it's like something coming out from you. And it's different in the third stage where the spirit within us wants to do something. If you don't do it, if you don't do it, you start feeling uncomfortable. It's the opposite. And the Bible talks about quench and grief. In the book of First Thessalonians, chapter 5, compared to Ephesians 5. But let's look at First Thessalonians first. And these are how they have the relationship with the Holy Spirit. Beside the nine gifts of the Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is invisible. But He is here with us. And is right now in your heart. And is stirring in your heart. As I speak these words now, what I'm sensing is a warming in my heart. I sense Luke 24, the same warm sensation that the two disciples on the way to Emmaus sense when they were walking with Jesus without knowing it was Jesus. And Jesus was talking from the scriptures about all the scriptures that fulfill what he just did. And when they reached near the village of Emmaus and they gave thanks for the bread, their eyes were opened and they saw Jesus. And when they saw Jesus, and they recognized Him, Jesus disappeared from their midst. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts warm when He spoke? So you will know there is the Holy Spirit flowing within you, speaking. And there's the, the warming sensation is like a confirmation. You're in the right flow. And sometimes when you're doing the right thing, some of you might sense, sensation. You're in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. The warm, nice sensation. And, um, but 1 Thessalonians 5 is a different sensation. In 1 Thessalonians 5 it says in verse 19 do not quench the spirit. And uh, then in Ephesians chapter Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians, you see here. 
or chapter 4 in verse 30 says and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God these are two epistles written by the Apostle Paul we learn about these things from the Apostle Paul you know why because he know about it the one who wrote about quenching the spirit must know what quenching is like the one who wrote about grieving the spirit must, not know, must also know what grieving the spirit is like. Quenching is, the Greek word quench is like water putting out a fire. So it's like a sensation of like something uh, 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 being taken off from you. It says, don't do that. Whenever the spirit will compel a suneko, if you didn't flow with it, <clears throat> you will feel a quenching sensation. It says in the next verse in First Thessalonians, do not despise prophecy. If the Spirit wants to use you in some manner, and you didn't allow the Spirit, let's say He has been telling you on point one, He is putting His love in you and He's saying, go and give this person a call. You need to minister to this person. You need to pray this for this person. Let's say you didn't obey you didn't obey, you might sense two sensations, either quenching or grieving. You might not see the Spirit, you might not hear the Spirit, but He is always here. He's here tonight. He's as real to us as Jesus in the flesh. And we need to be sensitive to Him. So when He tells us to do something, if we didn't do, there's a quenching sensation. Uh, how do you give an example? <coughs> Let's say <coughs> there is an opportunity for everyone to free flow with prophecy or words. And if you are nothing, you have nothing. But then if you got something that the Spirit wants to bring forth to you, and you know you're supposed to bring it forth, but you got free choice, you can choose. You choose not to bring it forth. At first, the Holy Spirit will keep reminding you, reminding you. Then after some time, when the time span, the, the, the open window to fulfill that is gone, you will have a strange feeling called quenching. You do that once, you do that twice, you do that several times, the Holy Spirit will not work in your life again. You cannot keep quenching the Spirit and expect the Holy Spirit to want to be close to you. Now I'm talking about the Holy Spirit as to try to be close to him as the closest person in your entire life closer than any human being the Holy Spirit is supposed to be closer to us than any human being and if you want to sense him then you should dare not quench him dare not grieve him grieve the Greek word grieve is a is a Greek word that conveys some sort of sorrow which, and Paul says, do not grieve the Spirit. In the context in Ephesians 4, he talked about, you know, being nice to one another, not, not being angry at one another, not doing all the wrong things. And when you've done something wrong, or say something wrong, you get a grief sensation of the Spirit. You do that one time, do that two times, do that several times. The Holy Spirit is so fed up with you, He will not work in your life again. He might just go off from your life for a while and then you go to you know, pray overnight. You know, maybe he waited 20 overnights and then he come back to you. Then, ah, you sense him again. We need to cultivate that relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so tonight, I just bring you these three points. Point one, the nine gifts of, nine fruit of the Spirit. The sense, the love of God. Romans 5 verse 5, that the Spirit shed abroad. And He keeps shedding abroad over and over again in any new thing. And number 2, Romans 14 was uh, 17. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy. Sense that kingdom atmosphere. Sense when you walk outside. And, it, and, and remember, it's not a ge geographical thing. God can send you to the most horrible places where the devil could be active, but because you're in the perfect will of God, you will still sense the peace of God right in the midst. He prepares a table 
for you in the presence of your enemies if he sends you to the enemy camp. So not talking about geography or anything. It can be naturally a bad place, a dark place, but you're missionary, you go forth. But you will sense when, when God didn't want you to be in that place, in that time, or do anything there, you step outside the boundary, peace, righteousness, peace, and joy disappear. And again, I brought First John to show that you're in and out of love and darkness to flow with. The third point we mentioned was uh, in the book of Acts, <coughs> where in Acts uh, 16, as he waited for Timothy and Silas to join him, and they joined him, his spirit was suneco, stirred up, pressed, compelled. And while compelled, you need to learn the other two words from First Thessalonians 5 and uh, Ephesians 4, uh, quench and grief. To understand that as you learn to flow forth, you must also learn uh, not to push him back if you want to flow forth, neither to f go into an area where he didn't want you to, or do something, or say something he didn't want you to, and then you grieve him. Remember Catherine Kuhlman. She walked closely with the Holy Spirit. One of the things when you see in her meeting, she always says, do not grieve the Spirit. She is so afraid of grieving the Spirit because she knows the Holy Spirit, if he's not happy, he will not flow. Now, if we all learn to walk closely with the Holy Spirit, you will get all the benefits of the Holy Spirit himself, which is, you will see the gifts of the Spirit operating. Power gifts operating, healing gifts operating, visions, revelations, all flow easily because the Holy Spirit is very happy. He's pleased with us. And miracles take place. And you will also see the angels working wonderfully because Holy Spirit is in charge of coordinating all the angelic work. Which means that your area of health, wealth, blessings, provisions, blessings, and blessings all those just flow because you are in the kingdom of God. In fact, you don't worry about anything else because you just are concerned about the Holy Spirit. Is He still with me? Is He flowing with me? And, uh, and is He still... And then you get this warm sense and say, you know, ah, everything is still okay. And you keep flowing with Him. Tonight, although He's invisible, He's here in our midst. Do not grieve the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. Flow with the Holy Spirit. Sense the Holy Spirit. And allow him to work his work in your life. And as you be more sensitive during your all-night prayer, you grow to be sensitive to him in your daily life. And every day we sense him. You cannot see him. You cannot touch him. But he stirs within your spirit. And he is a very real person. Very, very real. And the more you give place to the Holy Spirit, the more you enjoy the Shekinah glory of God and all the blessings that come with it. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we pray <coughs> that you teach us of the Holy Spirit. We know, Lord, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, Father, Many people think about all the power gifts and all the visions and all these uh, wonderful things that, and the anointings that flow. But many times they miss the most obvious, Lord. The love that flow, the peace and joy, and all the stirrings of the Spirit within us. To do some of the simplest tasks. We ask, O oh God, that we be a people who are sensitive to your Spirit who flow with the Holy Spirit. And here, Lord, we dedicate a night to flow with the Holy Spirit, to sense what He wants us to pray, to sense what He wants us to say, to yield to the utterance given by the Holy Spirit. We want to give ourselves to the Holy Spirit, to have a close relationship with the Holy Spirit. And tonight we pray for a desire for each one of us to walk closely with the Holy Spirit, to bind our lives as born servants and slaves to the kingdom of God, to the Holy Spirit, so that we are the temples of the Holy Spirit and we, we are bound to the Spirit and that our lives and our, our mind and our flesh all are, are, are laid before you so that only the Holy Spirit can feel us, flow through us and do all that He desires to do. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, for sending the Holy Spirit to be with us and to be in us. And help us to flow with the Holy Spirit, to welcome the Spirit, to allow Him to do a great and mighty work in each one of our lives, Father. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, Amen.